In this section, we're going to cover the underlying nature of the mental skills that you're going to be learning. And then at the end of the section, I'm going to put these skills within the context of three developmental modes that you're going to eventually learn to trade in, which would be first the mechanical mode, then the subjective mode, and then the intuitive. Everybody kind of have a good idea where we're going today? Maybe a little bit better of an idea than when you kind of walked in here? Yeah? Okay? So anyway, what I want to do is let's just, let's just go through and take a, a little bit of an attitude survey here, kind of get an idea where you're at. There are no right or wrong answers here. It's just a matter of what you believe about the nature of trading. So if we just kind of the money, making money as a trader is primarily a function of analysis. Who would agree with that? Everyone, come raise your hands. It's all right. You raise your hands. So you're telling me that only a few people would agree? Part of it? Okay. Okay. Uh, I often find myself thinking there must be a way to trade without having to take a loss. Come on, be honest. Come on. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll let's say I find myself thinking that there must be a way to trade without taking a loss, right? Okay. Okay. By the way, the first one, one, one of the things, one, I mean, this is, one, this is a primary, uh, uh, one of the things we're going to talk about a lot of making money as a trader is primarily functional analysis. That, that, that really isn't the case at all, what you're going to learn. In other words, trading is execution. Trading is execution. How, what you decide to do, of course, is analysis. And the problem is that it depends on what you're using your analysis for. If you're using your analysis to avoid the risk, then, then certainly making money is not a function of that because you will, you will virtually consistently lose. But we're going to talk about that more in a little bit, okay? Okay. Uh, I have trouble getting out of a losing trade. Who has, anybody here still have trouble getting out of a losing trade? Okay, that's fine. You won't have that trouble after today. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> really, my goal is that when you walk out of here, you will understand in no uncertain terms that there was absolutely, absolutely no reason to hang on to what you will define in advance as a losing trade. Do you find yourself planning trades you never execute and executing trades you never planned? That's a pretty common thing that affects most traders. There's always a cost associated with finding out what the market may do next. It's good to think that. That means you're accepting the risk. That there's a certain amount of I mean, cost, meaning a certain amount of risk involved in finding out what the market may do next. If I were to thoroughly analyze my trading results, I would find that my average losing trade is much bigger than my average winning trade. Well, there's a few people in here that, that might still be falling in that category. It only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of any particular trade. Who agrees with that? Anybody? Raise your hand if you agree with that, please. Nobody raises their hand. Oh, this is big. I love it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for not agreeing with that because you couldn't be further from the truth. You couldn't be more wrong. This is one of the things you're going to learn. It only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of your trade or your edge. That's all. Just one. You're going to learn that today. I wouldn't put on a trade if I wasn't sure it was going to be a winner. Who agrees with that statement? Please raise your hand. Please. Who agrees with that statement? Good. 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 I'm saying good because, because what I'm saying is that, yes, there is a gap here that we're going to have to fill between your particular attitudes about trading now and, and where you're going to end up with hopefully by the end of the day. I would answer this question, absolutely not. I wouldn't put on this trade if I wasn't sure it was going to be a winner. I trade, trade from the perspective of I don't know if any trade is going to be a winner. And I, and I don't have to know. As a matter of fact, that is one of the principal, let's say, principal concepts that you will have to adapt to become a consistently successful trader. And what the pros have adapted and the reason why they can do what they do is because they have learned, not just learned, but they believe without a shred of doubt that they do not have to know what's going to happen next to make money. And don't even think about it in those terms. They don't even think about it in those terms. It's not a matter of what's going, going to happen next. When you understand the nature of how technical analysis, how your technical formulas and your mathematical formulas interact with market behavior and what they can and can't do and what their inherent limitations are, you will also understand that I wouldn't put on a trade if I wasn't sure it was going to be a winner is absolutely one of the, one of the 
worst mistakes you can make to be a consistent and successful trader. It is, in fact, it's probably the number one. Kind of perplexing at this moment? Yes? Good. Okay, I always define my risk before I enter a trade. Does everybody here in this room at the point where they always predefine their risk? Who doesn't? Raise your hand. Please raise your hand. I want to know where everyone's at. Come on. It's all right. Okay. Sometimes I find myself blaming the market for what went wrong. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Does anybody, anybody feel betrayed by the market ever? <laughs> Any, anybody ever feel betrayed by, their, by their, 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 their signal, their technical signal, or whatever methodology that they use? We're going to talk about that in, in detail, too. The more a trader learns about the nature of the markets, the easier it will be for him to execute his trades. Who thinks there's a correlation there that the more I learn about the nature of markets and price movement, the easier it will be to execute your trades? Who thinks there's a co positive correlation there? Okay, again, couldn't be further from the truth. There's a negative correlation there. The more you learn, the harder it's going to be to execute your trades. To be, it depends on why you're learning it, of course, but we'll get into that. To be a successful technical trader, you have to determine what the market is going to do next. I already said that's not the case, so, so you'll, you'll know how to answer that one. But, but if I hadn't said it, how would you have answered it? Who would have said yes if I hadn't have already told you guys? A couple people? And you came to Houston? Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> okay, trading skills. Who are the professionals? We already talked about that. And why would it be beneficial to think like a professional trader? We already talked about that. What's the answer? Ah, anybody can make money, okay? We kind of already established the fact that anybody can make money as a trader. Consistent. Yeah, we're talking about consistency. What we want to do is we want to close that profit gap. We want, to, we want to make sure that our bottom line results reflect the potential of our methodologies. Okay? And that's what the professional has learned how to do. The professional has learned how to close that profit gap. They have learned the appropriate skills to do that. They're people just like you and me, okay? They're no different. They really aren't. They've evolved into a different way of thinking about trading. That's the reason why they can do it. And you can do it too. With understanding and awareness. That is really primarily what this workshop is about anyway. Because, because when you think about it, if you've read stories of people who, who have, have aspired to greatness in the, as a trader, you'll always find, with well, almost all of them, that there's this underlying thread, this underlying theme that, that virtually all of them have lost one or more of what they considered a fortune before they started becoming consistently successful. Why do you think that underlying thread or theme exists in their lives? What's that? Why do you think that commonality exists? Because at some point, they lose so often and then come back from losing, that one, they gain the confidence that they can do it, and as a result, the fear dissipates, and as soon as the fear is gone, they're trading from a carefree state of mind, and when you trade from that carefree state of mind, everything about your trading changes. Remember that the primary skill that we're talking about here is simply trading without fear. This is a trading skill. It is the primary skill that you will have to acquire to create consistency, to trade without fear. What does uh, consistency look like? I've already went through on the, on the grease board here and showed you a uh, consistently rising equity curve with the drawdowns, the normal drawdowns being a reflection of what? Can you, anybody remember what I said about that? What, what is that? Normal losses that reflect any trading methodology, right? Okay, what skills are necessary to experience a winning trade? Now, think about it. Now, I'm going to contrast, okay? I'm going to do a little bit of contrasting here. Just to, just to show you one of the reasons why it can be so difficult to get even into a frame of mind where we start asking the, the appropriate questions about what do I need to really be consistently successful? Because what does it really take to experience a winning trade? What skills do you need? Anybody got any idea? What skills do you need to experience a winning trade? What? What's your name, sir? Maurice, Maurice says a click of the mouse. Who's, who's with Maurice on that? Come on, who's, who's with Maurice on a click of the mouse? 
Got one, two, anybody else? Three, four, he's absolutely right, that's all it takes. There are no other skills needed. No other skills needed other than the actual physical ability to put your finger on the mouse button and click in the buy or the sell, and you can find yourself in a winning trade. You can find yourself in a, in a spectacularly winning trade far beyond what you could have ever imagine. And what skill did it take? What, what did it take? Just, just doing it, that's all. Just doing it at that, at that moment. Do you need an edge? Do you, need to ha do, you even, do you even have to know, even know what an edge is? Is it possible to just be, to, to walk up to your computer and the arrow happened to be on the buy button, you click and then find yourself in a winning trade? You didn't have an edge, did you? You just clicked it. What did it take? It took nothing. Do you need a plan? Need no plan. <laughs> Do you need the discipline to execute the plan? No, you don't need that either, do you? Now see, you're gonna, see the, the opposite of all this, of course, is, is what we're going to be talking about in terms of creating consistency. But go ahead. What you're saying is a blind squirrel will, catch, will eventually find a nut. Sorry. What you're saying is a blind squirrel will eventually find a nut. Did you say a squirrel? I'm sorry, yeah. squirrel. A squirrel. You, okay, squirrel. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I can click a mouse. You know, the arrow hits the buy, I click, I get a great trade. I'm a, that's good. It's all the things that lead up to me. That's the implementation. But what about all the things that lead up to that implementation? Oh, I understand. I'm not, I'm not negating that at all. I'm just saying that, 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 that the reality is you don't need anything. That's all I'm saying because I'm contrasting here. I'm just making a contrast between what you need to be consistent and what you need to win. Oh, okay. That's all I'm doing, okay? Now you just summed that up with what I was about to say. There's all the difference in the world between having the skills necessary to experience a winning trade as compared to having the skills necessary to consistently experience a winning Absolutely. Trade. That's what I'm that's all I'm talking about here. Because see there's because what this does is this the, the not understanding this contrast creates what I call like a huge psychological gap. Because if you don't because it's very easy for us to think that trading is easy. And if you believe that trading is easy, even if, you're get, even, if, even if all your experience is starting to tell you that it's not, it doesn't mean that that experience is dropping down to a level of realization where you change your behavior or change the way that you think about trading. If your first impression, if your first experience was that this couldn't be simpler. And then you spend, you know, how many X number of years or half a lifetime Finally coming to the realization that, you know what, yeah, to, to win, like what do you need, like I could, I could be in a casino and, and plunk a $100 bill down you know, at a blackjack table and, and end up with a blackjack. What did I need? I, nothing. I just happened to win. Now, if I want to be a professional blackjack player and make a, make a consistent income from playing blackjack, well, that's a, that's a whole other matter, isn't it? And we're talking about the same things here with trading. There would be a number of skills that I'd have to acquire to be able to make a consistent, reliable income as a blackjack player. And there are people who do it. Do you need a good reason to put the trade on to win? Do you need a good reason? No, not at all. What characteristics distinguish the pro from the typical trader? Well, they plan their trades. No. They execute their plan without error. Ah, we'll talk about trading errors in a minute. Big difference. Okay, they can move in and out of their trades with an ease and effortlessness that would boggle the mind of the typical trader. Okay, what do you need to achieve consistent results? Well, you're going you're gonna to need an edge. You're going to be able to identify an edge. You're going to have to have a trading methodology, are you not? Right? Okay. And you have to have a plan on how to utilize that edge. In other words, you're gonna to have to determine risk parameters. How much does it cost me to find out if this particular edge that my methodology provides me, how much is it gonna cost, to, how much is it going to cost me to find out that this edge is working on this particular trade or not? That's your risk parameter. Are you guys with me on this? Okay. 
money management parameters. In other words, how much your, your in other words, contract size or number of shares that you trade. All these have to be all this has to be taken into consideration. You could have a standard amount, or you could have an amount that fluctuates based on you know based on other criteria that you use, you know, to determine you know the, the level of trade that it is. Like it could be like a five star trade or a one star trade. With a five star trade, you go into the maximum position. With a one star trade, you go into the minimum position. And profit objectives. You have to be able to set profit objectives. See, just having a methodology to get you into a trade is not enough. You have to be able to determine what the risk is on a consistent basis. You have to know, you have to know what your money management parameters are. And you have to be able to determine where to take profits. These, none of these are easy things to do, are they? Trade execution. The ability to execute trades flawlessly so you can utilize your trading plan to its maximum potential. This is, this is the big one right here. This is the area because when you get right down to it, trading is about, ex trading is execution. The act of trading is executing trades. And if you're going to execute trades, you're going to have to be able to do them without errors. Because it just it doesn't make any sense to think that you will that you will achieve a consistently rising equity curve if you're constantly making trading errors. Trading errors would be defined as mistakes. Mistakes that detract from your bottom line results. Now the interesting thing about mistakes is that when you're when you're trading from the let's say the perspective of you know, it doesn't really take anything to win, then there really aren't any mistakes that you can make because anything that you do could, end, could result in a winning trade for any reason. But when we're talking about making consistent money or an income that we can rely on, then everything changes about this. Everything changes. What I'm talking about here is I'm talking about these like five or four broad skill sets to be able to create consistent results the kind of results that you can rely on as an income, you're going to have to learn an edge. You're going to have to acquire a trading methodology that gives you an edge. I'm defining an edge as that there's a higher probability of one thing happening over another. That's what an edge is. And you're, we're going to learn the nature of probabilities here in a moment. You're going to have to have, you know, you're going to have to uh, have a plan on how, do you, you, how you utilize that edge, meaning what the risk is, position size, and profit objectives. Then you're going to have to be able to execute. You're going to have to get to the point where you can execute that edge without making errors. For you to be able to execute that edge without making errors, you're going to have to learn how to trade from a carefree state of mind, meaning you're going to have to aspire to the point where you can trade without fear. And to trade without fear, you're going to have to learn how to think in probabilities. That's basically where we're going here. And I said this primary skill was learning how to trade without fear. Learning how to trade without fear is a function of learning how to think in probabilities. Meaning we're going to, we're going to set aside or move from thinking in a trade-by-trade -trade mentality. In other words, what this trade is going to do for me right now, am I right or wrong on this trade, and we're going to move to a series of trades perspective. Because that's what your methodology does anyway. Any trading methodology just gives you a, a win or loss ratio over a percentage of trades. In other words, if I take the same, take the same criteria that's in any kind of mathematical, any kind of technical formula that's mathematical ba mathematically based, or, or a, a, a technical price pattern that you would be able to see visually, what we're going to learn is that my edge, meaning a higher probability of one thing happening over another is simply going to give me a higher win rate over a series of trades. Let's say the next 20 trades. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And that the actual, on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, I don't know which one's going to win or which one's going to lose in advance. There is no way for me to find out. There's no way for me to determine that. That on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, no matter what reason or rationale that you come up with, is that there's no way to assure yourself that it's going to be a winning trade. There's nothing that can tell you that. That trading methodologies give you 
a win percentage, let's say 70% of the next 20 trades are going to be winners. There's no way I'm going to know which of the 70, you know, which, which 12 or 13 are going to be the winners or which 6 or 7 are going to be the losers. What you're going to learn, and this is what traders, what pro, the pro, professionals have learned, is that there's a random distribution between wins and losses over any given set of criteria that define your edge. There's a random distribution. I will get a higher percentage of wins to losses, but I just don't know which trades are going to be. It requires a complete shift in the way you think about trading. When you make this complete shift, everything about your trading will change. Now, I'm expecting you to make it now because I'm just still get, I'm still, we're still in the introduction. We won't really get into the meat of this until a little bit, but this is, this is where we're going, okay? That's all I want to get. This is where we're going. You're going, to, you're going to genuinely learn how to think in probabilities because when you've integrated, when you have genuinely integrated these concepts into your mental system at a functional level, your fear will go away. You do not need to lose everything to get to the point where you can figure out that, well, you know, I've got nothing to lose anymore, so I don't have anything to be afraid of. You don't have to do that, okay? You don't have to do that. All you have to do is commit yourself to learn how to think about trading in another way, and your fear will go away. Because what we're going to learn is the correlation between what we believe and what we feel. There's a direct correlation between if I'm going into a situation with a certain belief that, let's say, that my particular edge is going to tell me what's going to happen on this trade right here, I wouldn't even put this trade on unless I thought it was going to win. When you really understand the nature of price movement, which is what we're going to get into after we go through this section on, on skills, when, when you really understand that, you will never think that way again. When you really understand the nature of price movement, you won't think that way again. And that is one of the biggest problems that most, the, the typical trader has, let's say the typical screen-based trader, is that, is that they really don't understand the nature of how prices move and the underlying dynamics. Because you haven't had the exposure. You're, you haven't had the exposure to, to, to the direct markets. Your only exposure has been those blips on the screen. And as a result, there, there's a real gap in, in understanding about what's really happening. When you understand what's behind those blips, what's behind those photons that show up on your screen, when you really understand that, you will think about trading in another way, in, in a completely different way. It won't even occur to you to do some of the things that you're doing now. It won't even occur to you. Okay, now, so I've got, so we've got, I've given you three so far. The next broad area that you're going to have to learn, it's like, it's like you, can, you can be an expert at, at defining an edge. You can, even, you can even be able to execute your trades flawlessly and but run into the next challenge, and that's what I just call self-sabotaging beliefs. In other words... All of us have a sense of self-valuation. All of us have this, this sense that we're what we're worth as a person, you might say. And if, if you were to take like an old Ben Franklin accounting scale, okay, and this is positive and this is negative, meaning if you were to list every experience in your life, if you had, let's say, conscious access to every experience in your life, that contributed to a positive sense of self-valuation, that yes, I am a worthy person, because what we're running into, but I kind of got ahead of myself, what we're running into is this, is that when you learn how to define an edge and learn how to execute your trades flawlessly, what, what, you're, what you're now exposed to is the possibilities for unlimited wealth. There's really, there's really, not, there's really nothing holding you back. Well, let's put it this way. There's nothing on the outside that's holding you back, but there might be something on the inside that's holding you back. Those things on the inside could be self-sabotaging beliefs in the sense that 
if you listed all of the experiences that contributed to a positive sense of self-valuation and all experiences that, that, that contributed to a negative sense of self-valuation, that I'm not worthy as a person, I feel guilty about this, 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 and this, that you could end up, you know, you, could, you, go, you, you, go, you can go plus negative or, you know, net positive or net negative. What could end up happening is that if you don't have the, let's say, the skills or the awareness to realize that as your equity curve, as you start making money, these internal forces, if you have net negative, these internal forces start building up to the point where they'll cause you to make unconscious trading errors where you're not even really aware that you hit the sell button instead of the buy button, those kinds of things. And you have, to, you have to become aware of when these forces are starting to build up inside of you and either compensate for it by not trading, by to stop trading, or to find a way to neutralize them. And there are, there are various techniques available. But all I'm saying is that, is that these, kinds of, these kinds of errors that are the result of self-sabotaging beliefs don't really have anything to do with your direct trading skills. In other words, your ability to identify an edge and your ability to execute your trade but they can have an enormous impact on your equity curve. I would assume to, that you would be monitoring your equity curve and you would start seeing your curve go down in an abnormal way and you would start looking for your whatever's happening to you. Let's say you're not feeling well or whatever. Uh, uh, your wife just divorced you. I'm just, or maybe yes. something. Yeah, these, some, are all, these are all good things, right, things. So that you're bringing up. I mean, these are things what, that what are What I'm relevant. saying is, though, the, you show two extremes, <clears throat> a normal drawdown and then the, the boom or bust drawdown. There must be some way to know, at least I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, to know when you start looking that you're self-sabotaging. That's my question. Good question. As a matter of fact, there are software programs available now that will tell you that. There are software programs available that will tell you when, in other words, I'll give you an example. There, 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 I'll give you an example. When I was working with traders, with especially like hedge fund managers and, 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 and larger traders, there, there are people, first of all, there are people that, that their, their sole job was if they were, let's say they were central, here, let me think about how important this is. They had, let's say, this is, they're in the middle and they've got, and they've got, let's say, you know, 10 or 12 money managers. These are guys that all have, they're, they're managing funds, okay? This guy's sole responsibility was to shift money from here to here to here to each manager based on chart patterns of their equity curves. In other words, they would chart the equity of these particular traders, just like price patterns in the market, to determine their potential for inordinately large drawdowns because of self-sabotaging beliefs. That's how sophisticated the market has become. That's how relevant these issues are. So that you can actually chart your equity, and then you start to go like this, Oh, well, and then do another one like that. Uh, something's happening here, okay? I mean, it was, it was just, it was really kind of amazing to me when I was working with floor traders especially. I mean, this one guy, this pops into my brain just, just as you, as we're talking about this. I mean, you know, he came in for, for a consultation and he had his worst day in his life ever. Worst trading day, lost more money than what he's ever lost in his life. And I said, well, you know, and, and, and it's like normally, almost virtually, in every case, it, something catastrophic is happening in that person's life. But what was always amazing to me is how much of a disconnect that, that the person would have between the catastrophic event in their life and what they ended up doing as a trader in the market. And I said, well, you know, well, what's going on? And then he just, I just said, well, what's going on? And he just, he's kind of... Hey, well, yeah, my wife and I had this really bad argument last night, and you know, when I when I left, you know, when I left for the for the exchange this morning, you know, he he slapped his kids around and he kicked his dog, and you know, it's like, and then he came in and had his worst day and didn't make the connection between what you know between what happened what happened at home and what he did on the floor. 
I mean, he might have felt completely justified in, with the argument that he had with his wife in slapping his kid around and kicking the dog. But that's, that's what's going on consciously. But let's say subconsciously, you know, everyone has, you know, let's say, if a person's relatively normal, not a psychopath, you know, they've got, they've got some sense of, of fairness. And, and, he's, and he feels guilty about what he did. And he took that guilt out in, in the way he traded that day. The, the market is not a good arena to be doing this, by the way. Okay, this is, this is not a good area to be working these kind of emotional issues out. Go ahead. We, we need the microphone. You want, me to, you want me to put it right here and I'll just, I'll just hand it to him? My next question would be, the, the market also changes the patterns of the, or your edge may change in relation to the market. To distinguish between your own troubled state, let's say, and market behavior, uh, I can see that maybe one of these fellows here in the pie there might be using a system that is not as valid as it used to be when the market changes. How would you know if you were the guy in the center whether he was just having a, a, a bad stay with, with whatever's going on in his personal life versus uh, a change in his system in relation to the market. Another good question. You wouldn't know immediately, but upon investigation you could find out. In, in other words, by just talking to the guy or what, what, you, or what you do is that, see, see, what you do is you trade in sample sizes too. In other words, when you have a particular methodology that has, that has a defined criteria for when you get into a trade, what you do is you trade in a limited sample size so that if you trade in 25 trade sample sizes or like 20 or whatever, what you do is you analyze your results at the end of, that, at the end of a sample size. And if your results are satisfying, then what you do is you take another sample size. If the results are not satisfying, then because you, always, because you knew exactly what you did and under what circumstances you did it, you limited your variables, what you do is then you can go back and tweak your variables to see if you can improve your, improve your results. Because, because what's your name? Because what Tom, what Tom was really bringing up is, is the fact that you're right. Because we're taking a limited set of variables, a mathematical formula, to, that, that's a being applied to a dynamic event. And that dynamic event are traders who are acting on their own behalf, creating price movement, and they basically they create patterns that were doing the same thing over and over again, but you've got new people coming in with new ideas and old people leaving, and as a result, these patterns can change over time, diminishing the results of a particular edge. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that your sample size is large enough to adequately test that edge, but small enough so that if the edge is diminishing in its effectiveness, you're not losing an inordinate amount of money before you find that out. Does that answer your question? So that's how they find out. Okay. Besides that, there are because there's software available that'll it'll even tell you now. There's software, yeah. There's software available that'll that'll track your track your edges or to track your equity in a way that can indicate whether or not you're ready to take a hit. I don't know the name of it, but you know, because I just found out about it myself. So, what are, the, are some other ways that you can uh, address maybe a emotional problem you might be going through or other things outside of the trading area? besides stop trading? Well, you said there, I mean, there, there are a number of techniques, a number of books available. There's, there's counseling. You know, I mean, I'm going, to make, I'm going to make a recommendation of a particular book later on, you know, when we get into a little bit more detail. But, but uh, you know, it's, it depends on the effect that it has on your trading. I mean, you don't necessarily have to stop trading, but you, but you have to make an objective assessment as to, what, as to your state of mind. In other words, you know, you, you can actually say to yourself, am I in the best state of mind to be trading today? And, you know, and, and the kind of answer that you get back from yourself, you know, if it's relatively objective, it's like if you're really not in the best state of mind because of things that are going on in your life and some troubling aspects that you haven't reconciled, then, but you don't want to stop trading, well, at least you're aware of it by, in, another, another technique would be by keeping journals. Because most really good traders keep pretty extensive journals over you know, about you know what they're doing and what they're thinking while they're doing it, and then you, you make this assessment so that at least if you're not you don't want to stop trading, you still want to put your put whatever edges on you have for that day. You scale back. In other words, if your maximum position size is let's say five thousand shares, you're not in the best state of mind. Maybe you only want to trade a thousand. Maybe you only want to trade five hundred. In other words, to take these things into consideration. And you'd be surprised by just being aware of it and taking into consideration. A lot of times these, these things will, will, will reconcile themselves. 
I don't, does that help you? Yes, it does, thanks. Okay, okay. Okay, and the last area of the, these, these broad skill sets that we're talking about is develop the ability to recognize if you've crossed the threshold from normal self-confidence into a state of euphoria. <laughs> you guys are laughing. I finally, I finally got some giggles out of you, giggles out of you guys here. What's so funny about this? Anybody want to? Anybody want to want to share? <laughs> what? What's that? You don't want to be in a state of euphoria. <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, being in a state of euphoria. Let's put it this way: the, the primary, let's say, the, the the primary characteristic of the state of euphoria is that it's a state of mind of complete and absolute risklessness. Everybody get what I just said? You are in a state of risklessness. In other words, you have no ability whatsoever to perceive risk. So if, for an example, If this line right here, if below this line represents normal self-confidence and above this line is euphoria, and, and this threshold's different for everybody, by the way. I mean, there are certain chemicals that scientists have found that, you know, that, that, flood, our, that flood our mind and our body when we've crossed this, this threshold. I have, I've worked with traders who will flip into a state of euphoria with one winning trade. Okay, usually for most people it takes more than one winning trade. But I have worked with, I have worked with people that they'll flip into a state of euphoria with one winning trade. Now the problem with this, and it's a great state of mind to be in, I mean to be in a, a in, in virtually a riskless state of mind, I mean it's like, hey, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really a cool place to be, but the problem is that when we're in a state of euphoria as a trader, we are, I mean it's, it's virtually guaranteed that we're going to make a trading error. And the kind of trading error that we'll make in a state of euphoria usually has to do with position size. So for an example, if you're normal, if you if you normally only trade a thousand shares, in a state of euphoria, it's like, okay, let's let's mortgage the house. Okay? It's like, you know, let's go to ten thousand, twenty, thirty, whatever. Thousand shares. Because you see, you absolutely know for a fact. You wouldn't be putting on putting this trade on if it wasn't going to work. See, you know for you know for a fact. See, because there's no because you, you don't have any any ability to perceive risk at all. Now the problem, even though it could even end, end up being a winning trade, it's not that it's not that the, the trade might not end up being a winner. But here's typically what's going to happen: if you're a normal 1,000 share trader, and you go up to 10,000 shares. If when you put 1,000 shares on and the market went against you 5 cents a share, wouldn't be any big deal. You got 10,000 shares on when you absolutely knew for a fact that the trade was a winner and it goes 5 or 10 cents against you. It has the potential to flip you into a state of pure, unadulterated terror. instantaneously you'll go from euphoria to a state of terror in one instant because your expectations about what was going to happen were so resolute it creates a psychological shock that puts you in a state of mind freeze mind freeze Mind freeze is when you are conscious of what is happening, but find yourself totally immobilized to do anything about it. And so if the market happens to go 10 cents against you, but keeps on going, okay, you just sit there and watch completely immobilized while the market takes your money away until finally something flips you out of that. And you say, I, you know, you just come back to your senses and you had enough and you get out of the trade. I know that's probably never happened to anybody in this group, but, 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 uh, 
but I've worked with many people who it has happened with. <laughs> uh, so, so this is not something unfamiliar to anybody here. <laughs> uh, it's, it's like going literally from a state of mind it's like literally going from heaven to hell instantaneously and keep in mind the dynamics here it was all based on your expectation it's all based on your expectation So you guys have got this? Okay, there's, there's, so when we're talking about consistency, see, this is, goes back to when I was doing the contrast, okay, is that to, to experience a winning trade, you, you need nothing. I'm not saying that you don't put something into it, but the fact is you need nothing. There's no skills that are required to experience a winning trade. But to experience consistent results as a trader, there was the kind of results that you can rely on as an income. There are, there are, these are, there's some pretty kind of profound skills that we're talking about, are we not? You gotta have an edge. You gotta have a plan on how to execute the edge. You gotta be able to execute the plan flawlessly, or at least without, you know, without a minimum number of errors, or otherwise it's gonna detract from your results. You got to be able to recognize when you might have some self-sabotaging beliefs that are that are rising to the surface to say, "Hey, you know, this is too much money." Why? Have you, why do you think it is that you have probably read in the in some of the trading books? I know, I'm sure you have read at some point that someone gives you the advice that when you have windfall profits, to stop trading and take a vacation. Why do you think that that advice exists? Why do you think people have written that down? I just gave you the underlying dynamics for why that's true. It's not just the euphoria. No, it's not just no, it's not the terror afterward. It's it's the possibility for self-sabotaging beliefs coming in and saying, I am not worth this much money. Even though it's what I want. It's what I desire. It's what I've been working for. It doesn't mean that you believe you really deserve it. You have to believe you really deserve it to keep it. Or at least recognize that you don't necessarily believe it and don't do anything to give it away. In other words, take a vacation, put it in the bank, let yourself get used to having it, and, and at which point you'll say, you know what, yeah, I, you know, I do deserve this money. And then you'll be less likely to give it away. The, one of the best examples that I, that, I could, that I could give you to illustrate this is a floor trader that I work with, again, another bond trader, not as big as the other bond trader that I, was, that, I, that I referred to earlier. He was the kind of trader who had this reputation as, as, as I mean, being completely consistent. When I, when I met him, he, was, he would make anywhere from, I'd say, fifteen dollars to $20,000 a day. That was his daily, his daily thing, okay? Day in, day out, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a day. Never had these catastrophic bad days. That was his reputation, and it was true. And so, what did he need me for? Well, he he had hired a bunch of guys to trade his money, thinking that he's gonna. It'll, this is very common. You kind of have a funny look, but this is very common in Chicago where once you become successful and established, what you want to do is, is, is bring in, you know, as many, let's say, bring in young talent that you can, you know, uh, uh, teach your particular techniques and just, you know, multiply what you make based on their efforts. I mean, that's, you know. But the problem is that the guys that he brought into his group, they were, you know, I mean, I don't know how to put it. I, I, want, to be, I want to be nice. I want to... Uh, they were just they were just basically leeches. I mean, they a lot of them. When I you know talk to them, it's like I don't even. There's some some of them I don't even think wanted to be traders. They just they just saw the opportunity to be able to get money from him for and the opportunity to do something they hadn't done before. And and it was you know it was these were not the kind of people that that you would that you would hire under these circumstances. 
They weren't really suited for it. In many cases, they weren't really suited for it at all, especially the trade down on the floor. So he wanted particular, he wanted ideas on, on how to, you know, how to, how to build this, this group up into, you know, a really successful trading group. And while we were talking one day, we had ordered lunch in, somebody, a delivery person came to, with the lunch, and he, uh, and he was a devout Catholic, by the way. And this, is, this is a very important part of this. He was a devout Catholic. And he, and so devout that he carried a rosary with him all the time. He had a rosary in his pocket. And so when he, uh, he, he paid, you know, he took his wallet out of his pocket, paid for the lunch, and he took the change, and he just sort of unconsciously started to put the change in the same pocket with his rosary. And then we realized what he was doing. He took his hand out like that. And I said, well, you know, say, hey, what's going on? He said, well, you know, I can't put money in, can't, can't have money touch the rosary. And so we started exploring his beliefs about money and his beliefs about religion in relationship to money and certainly his beliefs about the Catholic Church and their beliefs about money. And, you know, once, and it's something he never really thought about. But when he thought about, you know, the Catholic Church certainly doesn't believe that money is dirty. So why should he believe that money is dirty in that respect? In other words, it's not spiritual to have money in a way that, you know, in a way that it can, in other words, there's a dichotomy in his mind between his ability to, his ability to, to make money in the pit, and yet you would think that in, a, in, a, in this kind of a situation, he would be giving his money away because he felt guilty about having it. Well, he didn't give it away as a trader because he was just too strong of a trader to do it. But he was giving it away in, in, with this organization, the kind of people that he had around him. In other words, it wasn't going out the front door, the money was going out the back door. So he did find a way to, to extract that money about his beliefs about money, religion, the Catholic Church, their beliefs about money, realize the, the, you know, the inconsistencies. And, and so as, as we're coming to kind of reconciliation about this, I gave him an exercise to see if, if in fact, he'd really accepted what it is that we were talking about. And what do you think the exercise was? Come on, what do you think the exercise was? It's not that hard. Go ahead, put some money in that pocket. Yeah, that's right. Put, put, put money in the pocket with the rosary. Put the money and the rosary together. He couldn't do it. He literally, his, 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 his arm, he tried to put the money in. It, it, it was like, it, it got, it got like he could not do it. His beliefs that we talked about were so strong that it literally wouldn't consciously let him do it. But he worked on it. See, he, he wanted to get to the point where he, he recognized the validity of the things that we were talking about, and so he did want to do it, and so he kept on trying. It took him about a week. And once he got the money in with the rosary, he had like all these conflicting beliefs he had about the nature of money and the guilt that he, that he felt over it, it just, they just sort of all melted away, and he fired all these people. <laughs> He didn't even try to make them traders because he realized that they, you know, these were not guys that, you know, that really wanted to be traders. He realized what he was doing. He realized he was just, he was just giving his money away. What gives a professional trader the ability to execute their trades without error? They are confident, meaning they are no longer encumbered by the same fears that plague the typical trader. Trading without fears is learned mental skills. I've already given you examples of mental skills. Remember what, what did we say about, about the ability not to choke? Okay? Under, that would be an example of a mental skill. Learning to trade without fear, hesitation, or internal conflicts is a function of believing that you don't have to know what's going to happen next on a trade-by-trade -trade basis to win or make consistent money. This is, the, this is the heart of it right here, everyone. Okay? This is the heart of it. And again, we're still in the introduction, believe it or not. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to reinforce all this. But eventually, what you're going to do is get to the point where you believe that you do not have to know what is going to happen next on a trade-by-trade -trade basis. This trade and this particular trade and this particular trade, you don't have to enter these trades thinking that you know it's going to happen next to win, to make consistent money. And that when you stop believing that, you will start making consistent money. Because it's, the, it's your expectations about this trade winning that's, that's going to mess you up. Go ahead.
what you're really saying is you have to have a belief in your plan or your methodology and you're looking for a probabilistic result saying over a period of time I will execute 60, 70, 80 percent of my trades. The one I'm going into now could be a good one, could be a bad one. That's right. I don't care. That's right. Exactly right. Perfect. Thank you. This is where we're going. Okay? Thinking, assuming, or believing you know what will happen next creates an unrealistic expectation in a, specific, in a specific outcome. What's wrong with unrealistic expectation? Well, think about, let's see, expectations in relationship to the, the characteristics of humanity. You can, this cuts across all, everybody, and cuts across all cultural, all cultural lines or barriers. Everyone, it, well, first of all, we can get, get to that point. What is an expectation? An expectation is a mental representation. In other words, a belief, an assumption, or an opinion, or whatever. Thinking, assuming, or believing. A mental representation of what the next moment, meaning next moment, next five seconds, or the next in ten seconds, or the next hour or whatever, is either going to, in the environment, in other words, we have a mental representation, and we have an external environment that expresses itself, okay? So my mental representation, meaning my expectation, if the, if the environment shows up in a way that is consistent with what I believe, then what, it, what, will, what will my state of mind be? This is a universal characteristic of humanity. This isn't any different with anybody. Anywhere, how will I feel? What will be my state of mind? What will be my experience? I'll be in a state of satisfaction, a state of well-being. I could be joyous. I could even end up in a state of euphoria. The degree to which the environment does not express itself in a way that's consistent, what I, the way, consistent with the way I think it's either going to look like sound like, taste like, smell like, or feel like, okay, I will be in a state of dissatisfaction, a state of betrayal, disgust, anger, fear, terror. Your ability to create consistent results as a trader is all about what you expect. When you change your expectations to be consistent with the way the environment, the market environment exists, the fear will go away. When you change your expectations in a way that's consistent with the way the actual market environment exists, your fear will go away. And you'll be able to do exactly what you need to do when you need to do it without conflict, without hesitation, and be able to close that profit gap between what your methodology will give you and what you end up with in your bottom line. Unrealistic expectations cause us to define and interpret and therefore perceive market information as threatening. Ultimately, we can look at, we can break the market down to its lowest definable component parts. If we break the market down to its lowest definable component parts, what we end up with is up and down ticks. Okay? An uptick, an uptick is one incremental price change where the price moved from one to two, from two to three, four, five, six, whatever, and then down ticks. Okay? When we're operating out of unrealistic expectations, we're going to tap into four primary trading fears that will cause all the errors that we make as traders. Those fears are the fear of being wrong, losing money, missing out, and leaving money on the table. And those fears will actually cause us to perceive these up and down ticks as threatening. And what we're going to learn about the nature of fear a little later is that fear will cause us to focus on the object of our fear so that we end up creating the very experience we're trying to avoid. Therefore, if I'm trying, if I'm afraid of being wrong, I will actually perceive this information in a way that causes me to be wrong. 
If I'm afraid of losing, I will perceive these up and down ticks in a way that will actually cause me to lose. If I'm afraid of missing out, I'll actually create the experience of missing out. And if I'm afraid of leaving money on the table, that's exactly what I'll end up doing. Now, when you think about the nature of these up and down ticks and the photons that appear on your computer screens, is, is, there, is there an inherent characteristic in that information that's threatening in any way? In other words, is it, is it information? Is it, in other words, when we talk about the nature of emotional pain, which is, which is the threat of pain, okay, the, the fear, not physical pain, where if we have, a, if all of us have <coughs> a normal nervous system, and we come into contact with a physical object, object, you know, if I hit this with my arm, it's going to hurt. If you hit it with your arm, it's going to hurt. So, so we've got some universal commonality. But with emotional pain, it's not that way at all, although we think that it is. It's not. Because <clears throat> emotional pain requires an interpretation. And then interpretation comes from what we believe. You guys with me on this, on the interpretation part? Because, see, the information itself, the up and down ticks, have no charge to them whatsoever. They're not positively or negatively charged. They're just up and down ticks. That, based on your ability to read those up and down ticks, tell you what the, what the potential is for the market to move in any particular direction. If you're perceiving them as threatening in some way, that's definitely going to cause you problems when it comes to creating consistent results. In fact, you're going to find it impossible. Okay, let's talk about some typical trading errors. The typical trading errors, the professional has evolved beyond. Don't define the risk in advance of putting on a trade. Why in the world, now of all the trading books that you've ever read, out of all the workshops you've probably been to, I'm sure that you have been exposed to this particular piece of advice countless times. And yet, it is, it is the primary trading error that people commit all the time. They don't predefine the risk in advance of putting on a trade. If you don't predefine the risk in advance, you're operating out of the mindset that you think you know it's going to happen next. And what I'm going to establish from you when you establish for you when we get into the next section is that that is absolutely not the case. It doesn't mean we don't think that, but the reality is it isn't the case. See, because when we, have, when we predefine our risk, let's put it this way. If, if I'm the typical trader operating out of the four fundamental fears, the fear of being wrong, the fear of missing out, losing money, etc., we've got a real problem here because our minds are naturally wired to associate. In other words, they automatic, our minds will automatically make connections, meaning this, that if I, if I'm, if I get into a trade and I end up being wrong. I expect it to win, and I'm wrong. I have to admit that I'm wrong. It isn't just admitting that I'm wrong on this one trade. Our mind, because the way our minds are wired, it has the potential to tap us into the accumulated, the accumulated, the accumulated negative energy of every time I've been wrong in my life. Okay? So if this circle represents a huge ball of negative energy inside of our mental environment about what it means to be wrong, being wrong on just one trade could tap us into that pain. And it's going to work differently for everybody. Everyone's mind works, works a little bit differently. But that's the potential. If you wonder why people seem to live and die on the outcome of the next trade, this is one of the reasons why. This is why it's so important. Because it has the potential to tap us into the accumulated negative pain of every time we've been wrong in our lives. Every time we've lost something in our lives. Every time we've missed out on an opportunity that we didn't take advantage of. Every time we've been in an opportunity and didn't get the maximum amount that was available. Those are the four fears. 
So the problem with predefining our risk is this, is that if I'm afraid of being wrong, and I don't know how to think about trading appropriately in a probabilistic mindset, I'm not going to get into this trade unless I think I'm right. And the problem with predefining the risk is that it requires that I gather evidence as to why it might not work. Predefining your risk requires that you gather evidence as to why it might not work. Well, I wouldn't even be getting into in the first place if that were the case. So I'm, I'm going to gather as much evidence as possible to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. Because if I start gathering evidence as to why it might not work, then I might talk myself out of taking the trade. And then if I end up talking myself out of taking the trade and it turns out to be a winner, I'll probably be in more emotional pain than what I would have been in had I taken the trade and it turned out to be a loser. So I just make sure that I've got all my ducks in a row and I don't take the trade unless I do. And therefore, what I have done, now think about this, what I have essentially done is define the risk out of the trade. I've gone through a mental process in which I have literally defined the risk out of the trade. Why do I have to put a stop in the market and predefine my risk if I know I'm going to win? A professional trader just doesn't think that way. They would not, I'm not saying that they never thought that way. I'm not saying that, that they didn't experience the exact same thought process that I just took you through. I'm saying they have evolved beyond it. They would never allow themselves to get into a trade without predefining the risk. In other words, what does the market have to look like, sound like, or feel like to tell me this trade isn't working? The next error, define the risk, but don't take the loss, and it turns out to be a bigger loss. That's probably, again, probably one of those things that never happened to anybody in this room, but just in case someone watches the DVD where this sort of thing has happened, I, I included it. <laughs> Same dynamics, basically. Hesitate, get in too late. Why are you going to hesitate? Why are you going to hesitate to get in? If, you're, if the criteria that you use to define an, edge, define an edge is present in this moment, why would you hesitate? Because you don't think the trade's going to work. You have doubt. In other words, you are either thinking, believing, or assuming that you know what's going to happen next. Think of the connection here. You couldn't hesitate unless you either assumed, think, or believed that you know what's going to happen next. If you operate out of the perspective that you don't know what's going to happen next, I don't need to know what's going to happen next to make money, then there's no point in hesitating. Jump the gun. Get in too soon where the signal never actually develops. Coming off of a winning trade. You're going to jump the gun when you come off a winning trade or a series of winning trades, right? And you're just so excited about what you see developing. Eh, the signal isn't quite there yet. But you know what? Let, let's get in before everyone else. And you never actually get a signal. That's a trading error. But see, the, the point, that doesn't mean that you couldn't win. See, what you're going to find is that when you trade on what I call a trade-by-trade -trade basis, see, we're going to make, the, we're going to make the, the distinction between trading trade-by-trade -trade and tra trading over a series of trades. When you trade trade-by-trade, -trade, it means that each individual trade is like a life-or-death thing. In other words, I, I wouldn't be putting this trade on if I didn't think this trade was going to win. Not that... Not the other, the, 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 um, the opposite of that, was, which is I'm going to put on the next 20 trades because I think that 70 or 75% of them or 50% of them are going to win. There's a huge difference in perspective. So if you're coming off a winning trade or a series of wins, you're likely to jump the gun. But the interesting part about all this is that each one of these errors that I'm giving you could all result in a winning trade. You could do every single one of these things and still win. 
You could not predefine your risk and still find yourself in a winning trade. You can hesitate and find out it's exactly, exactly the right thing to do in that moment. You can jump the gun and find out it's exactly the right thing to do in that moment. You can not take your loss and the market comes back in your favor. All these errors that we're talking about, you can commit over and over again, and they can end up having, you can end up experiencing positive results. Except one thing, one thing, is that when you indulge yourself in behaviors, in these kinds of behaviors, it could lead to usually, a, no, not could, it virtually every time leads to a catastrophic loss. Catastrophic. You put on a trade without predefining your risk three or four times in a row and turns out to be a winner. And then the next one, you don't do it. That's the one that's going to be the catastrophic loss. See, so on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, you can do anything for any reason and commit any error or what would be considered an error in the perspective of trying to create consistency and still win and still have winning streaks and still have a lot of fun. But you're setting yourself up for catastrophic losses. Get out of a winning trade too soon and leave money on the table. There's, there isn't a trader alive who hasn't experienced that. Let a winning trade turn into a loser without having taken any profits. All these errors are the result of Thinking, assuming, or believing that we know what's going to happen next. Move a stop closer to an entry point, get stopped out, and the market trades back in your favor. In other words, what would that tell you? If, you, if you're here, if you buy at this price right here, and you put your stop here, this is, all you're really saying is that this is, this is how far I'm going to let the market trade against my position to tell me that this trade is either not working at all, or that the potential for it working is so diminished that it's not worth me staying in any longer, and then the market starts to drift down to your stop, and then you move your stop up, and you can get stopped out, and then the market does this. What would that tell you about your attitude? What? Yeah, and you hadn't accepted the risk of that trade, did you? See, see, people can put stops in the market. It doesn't mean they've really accepted the risk. You can put a stop in the market, but it doesn't mean you've genuinely accepted the risk. This would tell me, someone came to me and said, Mark, this is what I did. This is what I know. I know that you didn't accept the risk of that trade or you wouldn't move the stop. What? Yeah, you can move it the other way too, you know, because, it, well, that's because you don't want to admit you're wrong. The professional trader is no longer susceptible to these typical trading errors because he's learned to think in probabilities. When you understand the relationship between how prices move and the mathematical formulas and price patterns that make up a trading methodology, patterns that make up a trading methodology, quantifies that movement into tradable edges, then why you have to learn the skill of thinking in probabilities will become self-evident. In other words, when we get through the next section, the way you need to think, I want you guys to be at a point where it just becomes completely self-evident as to why you need to think in probabilities to make consistent money. It just makes sense. It's just like, oh, yeah, okay. This makes absolute sense. The three developmental modes of trading. Now, I, I gave you the broad skill sets that you have to learn to, to create consistency. Well, within w those broad skill sets are within the three, what I call three developmental modes of trading. There's mechanical trading, subjective trading, and intuitive trading. There's three stages. In other words, in mechanical, what you want to do is you want to you want to trade with rigid a rigid criteria that defines your edge. All execution decisions are made in advance of market activity. The market either confirms your conforms to your definition of an edge or not, and you you execute your you execute your trades based on a plan. In other words, what you're doing in the mechanical mode of trading is you're limiting the number of variables that you're dealing with in the market. Because what you want to find out is this. You want to find out what works and what doesn't. This is where, to find out what works and what doesn't, you can paper trade. In other words, you can, you can actually take a particular trading strategy and methodology and forward trade it with paper trading, or if you've got software that, that does the analysis for you, you can do it that way too. But it's better to probably paper trade it so that you're actually interacting with your particular variables that are defining an edge. 
So you're finding out what works and what doesn't. If you use an unlimited number of variables and define an edge, when you're training randomly, you never, never find out what works and what doesn't. So you have to learn that. You have to have confidence in that. But the other part of it, too, is finding out whether or not your own personal psychology is made up in a way that you can actually execute that edge. And the problem with the execution part of it is that paper trading doesn't cut it. You actually have to have money on the line. And so what you do in the mechanical stage is that you use the mechanical stage as a means to learn trading skills. In other words, your focus is on skills and not necessarily on how much money you're making or not making. Because when you've acquired the appropriate skills, the money will simply just be a byproduct of those skills. And then what you do is that if you find that you cannot execute your plan, then you're going to have to, you're going to, have to get into a mode where you learn exactly how to do that, which is what we're going to get into later on. But the point is, is that, that, that what I recommend to people is that if they're having problems executing their trades, in most cases it's because they're probably, they're probably, their position size is too large. In other words, if, they're, if once, they, once they learn that, they, that, that there's a, a specific regimen in which they can learn to be consistent, you know, what they want to do is they want, they, want, they want their cake and eat it too, sort of. In other words, they want to learn the techniques, but they don't want to cut themselves off from still making a lot of money. When the reality is they don't have the psychological skills to be able to execute trades based on the way they were trading before. So if they were a 5,000 share trader before, they'll set up these exercises that we're going to talk about later on in the afternoon with 5,000 shares and then, and then completely blow it and can't do it. The reality is their psychological makeup is such that they may only be able to trade, do it, and do it flawlessly with 10 shares. So I work with people who had to go down to one. To be able to execute it flawlessly, they had to go down to one share. And then they work their way up. And then they go to two, and then they go to five, they go to 10. They just work their way up. I mean, is there anybody in this room who hasn't paper traded? And who, is there anybody in the room who hasn't experienced being able to execute your trades flawlessly on paper? But then when you, when you try to execute your plan with real money, it, it doesn't work? See, the plans, the plan's working, you're not working. This is what mechanical trading is all about, okay? Mechanical trading is finding out just how big that gap is. You cannot take for granted that because you recognize an opportunity to enrich yourself in some way, that you have the skills to be able to take advantage of it appropriately. You can't take it for granted. And most everybody does. So mechanical trading gives you all this information. It gives you, it tells you what works and what doesn't in the market and what works and what doesn't with you. So that you know what you need to focus on to be able to make consistent money. You guys, you guys with me on this? Yes. Is it making sense? Okay, then you can evolve, if you want, to the subjective stage of trading. Because you can make consistent money trading mechanically. Okay? That's, I mean, it's, but most people like to be able to use their, their rational thinking and process and try to figure things out. And the subjective stage of trading is simply, this is a broader, more flexible mode of trading where you use everything you've ever learned about the price movement to determine your edges. In other words, you know, all the different patterns you've learned, all the different nuances of, 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 of market behavior will determine, you know, where you get in, how much profit you take, where you set your stops. You see, in the subjective mode of trading, in the subjective mode, if someone said to me, okay, uh, I'm buying here, and my stop is here, but the market's starting to come down to my stop, and I get out right here, and I don't let, my stop get, I don't let myself get stopped out at my original spot, in the, it truly, for someone who's evolved in the subjective mode of trading, that's all right. You can do that. Because you're, you're not doing it out of fear. Or you're not doing it out of the fact that you haven't accepted the risk. You're doing it because you recognize the pattern that the market is giving you is such that there's a high probability you are going to get stopped out. And so, therefore, you might as well just scratch your trade or, or, or get out with, it with a little bit of a loss. It's not because you're afraid. There's a huge difference. You guys with me on this?
And then the last stage is the intuitive. This is the most advanced mode of trading. It would be the equivalent to getting a black belt in martial arts. It's when you find yourself in the zone, tapped into the collective consciousness of the market, giving you a sense of the flow. If you look at the market as being, you know, a collection of individuals, you can tap into that. You can find yourself. It's not something you will yourself into. You just find yourself in the, in the zone where you're just seeing and doing things that you can't necessarily explain at a rational level. And the problem is that there are people, everyone has intuitive capabilities, there are, but, but some people it's completely shut off, and with others, you know, they don't trust it because, you know, they, 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 don't, they can't make the distinction between what's intuition and what's just their mind hoping that something's going to happen, or hoping that, you know, what they see is, is, is really what's going on, and making it feel like intuition. The problem is, until you acquire these fundamental skills that we're talking about, you definitely don't want to be trading based on intuitive impulses. You just want to make note of them. When you've got the skills and find yourself in the zone, then go ahead and do whatever, whatever comes to your brain until you flip yourself out of it. Meaning, when you start thinking at a rational level, you mostly you flip yourself right out, of the, right out of the zone. Because your rational mind wants to know, wants reasons. Your rational mind wants logical reasons, and these intuitive impulses don't come from that part of your brain. They come from that creative part of your brain. And by definition, creativity is bringing something forth that didn't previously exist. It may exist somewhere in the world or in the universe somewhere, but it didn't exist in your mind, and it's outside the parameters of what you already believe. So there's going to be an instant conflict between what you think at a rational level and your intuitive impulses until you train your rational mind to accept your intuitive impulses. Got that? <laughs>